Hi everyone, how's it going? Uh, welcome to this uh, a new meeting um, with the Yorka series. Uh, we're here um, joined by Nathan Pettigrew and uh, I'm Nick Long and Elena is going to be coming in a bit later. So um, Nathan is a wildlife enthusiast and photographer and has got uh, one of the only government um, issued uh what is it again? It's an issued. It's a it's a marine mammal permit. It it pretty much allows me to um, uh, get quite close to uh, the likes of orca and southern right whales and humpback whales and things like that in my kayak. So what happens, Nathan, if um, like a member of the public goes along and goes out in their kayak and tries to do what you do? What happens to them? Is... Yeah, I mean they can um, obviously they can be fined um some people can be prosecuted right um it, it's a it's a bit of a tough one because our orca as you probably know are you know quite close to shore yeah their the, their food source is in very very shallow water which is often where we are and mm. um so we often uh, we often encounter them quite quite a bit and you know sometimes the, the orca quite often the orca will actually come up to us and that's okay you know, if it's on their terms, that's totally fine. So, um, do you want to talk about a little bit what you're doing at the moment, uh, Nathan? Uh, just give a quick intro for the people that don't know you from the group, and yeah, the stuff that you're sharing on there. I'll talk about how I sort of got into it, I guess. Well, that'd be um, brilliant. We'll start, yeah, start that. yeah. So, so basically, I um, oh god, I'm going to be 48 on Monday. Oh my gosh! Um, Happy birthday! Since I was a little kid, thanks, mate. Yeah, still, it's, <laughs> I'm still, I'm still reveling in the 47 year old stage but um <laughs> one day it's gonna be blown up. but basically the reason i mentioned this is because um i had a fascination for wildlife since mm. i was a kid i mean yeah. and i didn't grow up near the beach at all but i just had this fascination for for wildlife in particular uh, marine life and i used to watch a, a tv show called our world which was on on a friday night and i'd see all these animals and be absolutely blown away and i my thought process was that these animals that we I saw on tv weren't in new zealand for some reason i used to think they were in some faraway place um unbeknown to me of course we had them right here on our back doorstep so eventually i think when i was about 15 16 years old i moved away from that area and i moved right by the beach and um then i got into kayaking and i actually got into kayak fishing is, is how it came about and um, when I was out there fishing, I would start to see marine life. I started to see eagle rays and stingrays and um, and sharks and things like that. So I stopped taking my fishing rod and I started taking a camera. Mm. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I started going out, you know, I was, I was out there quite a lot because the passion to see some, see some of the stuff and maybe discover new stuff was, um, you know, so exciting for me. So I got out there every chance I could get with a camera. And... Um, you know, I never forget my first orca encounter, of course, um, my first southern right whale encounter. And, yeah, so I started taking photos and I had such an accumulation of shots and video footage that I thought, well, there's no point in doing, not doing anything with this. You know, mm. what's the point of, you know, not doing this and uh, having these photos, sorry, and doing nothing with it? So um, I just went on Facebook, I think, and said, oh, I'm happy to do some talks at some schools to show what amazing marine life we had. And, and you know, nobody knew what we really had. It wasn't really out there, um, like literally right in our back doorstep. And, and I'd actually put together a video. Um, I just whacked this video together in about 25 minutes and it went online and it went viral. It went crazy. It was shared on Facebook about 12,000 times and, uh, I had um, interviews with Daily Mail in the UK and all these different agencies around the, around the world. And it kind of put me on the map and it put our area, um, which is a place called Tauranga um, in New Zealand here, it put this area on the map for wildlife. And um, so I thought, okay, so I'll carry on with these, um, with these school talks and um, they're, they're free. Everything I do, by the way, is, is, is free. I, I don't charge anything for my talks my photos nothing but we'll cover that soon um and the kids loved it you know and a guy actually sent to me so i cover everything from um eagle rays to stingrays to bronze whaler sharks um obviously orca dolphins and all the rest of it and um and the kids you know primary school kids they love it 
And then it went on to talking to adults and things like that as well. But the kids, I, a friend of mine in the US actually sent me this Megalodon tooth. And I know this is not an awkward thing, but I'm going to try and hold it up there. Whoops. So, you know, the kids, you know, start talking about the history of wildlife. Um, and the kids love it. And I have a, I've got a sperm whale tooth as well. So, um, so you know, eventually I'm doing these, these talks and um, a lot of the videos I had was actually of me myself actually breaking all the rules. I was in my kayak and I was getting close to Walker and all the rest of it. And I was having a great old time. <laughs> and then one day uh, I got a phone call from the department of conservation mm -hmm. and they said, Oh, we want to, we want to talk to you. Oh. And I thought, uh Oh, <laughs> uh oh, yeah. And I remember I, uh, I never forget. I was really nervous and I put on a nice shirt, button up shirt. And um, I even ironed it, Nick. I even ironed it. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, you know, I went and saw the Department of Conservation, the local office, and um, they sat me down. They interviewed me for about an hour. And they said, you know, what are you doing with this footage? Are you making money from it kind of thing? And are you basically what they want to know is, are you pro profiting from marine yeah. mammals? That's where it gets a bit messy. You know, you yeah. can't – any old Joe Blogs can't profit from marine mammals, really. And I said, no, no, it's just it's my passion. You know, it's what I want to do. I, I love showing the kids what we've got because they're the next generation of people that are going to look after this wildlife once we're all gone. Yeah. So in the end, they actually said to me, hey, look, you know, um, we can't really do what you're doing. Um, you know, we don't really, we don't have, they, didn't have, they didn't have time. Um, they didn't have the numbers for people to be able to do it. And here I am doing it for them pretty much. And so they said, look, we're actually going to give you a marine mammal permit. It's um, It was the first non-commercial non-research permit to ever be given out in the country. Wow. Uh, and as I say, that allows me to get um, to get it to get in close to orca and and whales and things in my kayak. Does that so, cover the entire entirety of New Zealand, the two islands? Uh, for New Zealand orca it does. Oh, okay. um, for New Zealand orca it does and for you know bigger cetaceans like humpbacks and southern rights, it's this area. Yeah. Which is fine. I yeah. mean I've had the permit some years now and i i haven't gone to other places around new zealand to photograph you know i haven't done that i don't i don't really need to yeah need to yeah. yeah yeah because the new zealand orca the north island ones and we'll talk about it soon but the new zealand orca um you know they generally often stick to their own areas so it's the same orca that i see all the time anyway i don't need to go to a different part of the north island to see them because they can they are going to come here yeah but again so, you know, so that's how I, that's how I kind of got into it. And I, I got this permit and I thought to myself, okay, now, now this is where the work needs to be done. Now I start, now I can start this whole, um, uh, we call it kaupapa, but this whole involvement in, um, you know, showing people what we've got and what we can do to look after it. Mm. Now that's, that's interesting that you mentioned that because like, uh, before that, like you said, you were doing it mostly as a kind of a hobby and a kind of like a personal interest and passion. But now you have this responsibility. You're given this permit yeah. and you're you're now having to think about what you're going to do with it. And mm. what was the plan uh, initially or has that changed from the beginning and, and, and what's it look like going forward in the future? Yeah, good question. I mean... <clears throat> There's, there's really nobody here in New Zealand in the sense of promoting marine mammal regulations, you yeah. know, how we can um, be better around the wildlife. No one's doing it, you know, not on a biggish, not on a big scale and certainly not in front of media. You know, yeah. I've had, um, I've been fortunate enough. I, I, used to, I was writing for a magazine for six years. Um, the radio stations get hold of me. In fact, they got hold of me last week. And I had an interview with them, and they know that there's going to be some conservation messages messages come through. You know, they yeah. just that's what I'm about, and they know that. So uh, there was never really a game plan. It's kind of just evolved. But I've always prided myself on being different to everybody else, um, doing what other people aren't doing, or kind of doing what they're doing, but but taking it a step further. And um, so this was an this was untouched territory in New Zealand when it came to really promoting the right thing to do around wildlife and the thing is you don't you know it's not about shoving it down someone's throat you don't want to be like don't do this don't do this it's about hey mate you know have you thought about doing this because you know for whatever it's, it's that i've been in sales for a while 
and um it's about talking to people you know and yeah. and respectfully respectfully talking to people so um but you know it evolved into other things as well i, I take care of um i say i take care of it's possibly not quite, it's quite strong words i have a lot of involvement with um fur seals and various seals around around this area so the department of conservation here they know that i'm available throughout the winter um to check on local seals because our seal population um, basically um, skyrockets and they turn up in some odd places um, in people's houses mm. you know some of these little yeah. some of the seal some of the seal pups um, have been have been going through people's cat doors wow Jeez. yeah okay yeah so people are finding little little baby seals in their um in their houses so yeah myself and doc will then go along and and remove them so there's all that side of it as well yeah so they, would you be able to find the mothers after that? Like, at, like you can imagine that it would be. Yeah, no, they went. That. Yeah, no, they're they're basically weaned off. Um, oh. the parents pretty much leave them to it from about six months to twelve months old. Wow! And because okay. of that, yeah, because of that, we get a lot of um a lot of fatalities and and it was seal pups. Um, you know, sometimes I'll bear. You know, this is sad to say, but this is nature's way. We need to remember this. Yeah. Uh, but some mornings or some days, I'll I'll bury you know, seven or eight seal pups. Wow. In a day, yeah. What's the population it's nature's way size is that... overall, like, uh, Nathan? What's the, what's what's right the population now? size overall for those? Uh, for those uh, yeah, uh, I think we're sitting on around 200,000 for New Zealand fur seals. They, right. they, they used to be two and a half million. Wow. Um, and then they got hunted for their um, for their fur and for their oil. Yeah. Uh, the, last, the last legal hunt in New Zealand for the fur seal was 1946. And um, numbers are starting to bounce back uh, quite well, actually. In fact, I think they're bouncing back quicker than any other marine mammal in this country. They sound mm. like they could have been, you know, easily put into extinction by the sounds of it. Um, yeah, well, they got, you know, like I say, they, they went from two and a half million and they got hunted down to about 8,000. 8,000? 8,000, yeah. So you'd only wow. see them around small pockets around the South Island. So, um, right. I know we're supposed to be talking about orca, but this is <laughs> this is all, it's all part of what I do, you know. But um, you know, we get leopard seals as well, which is quite cool. Um, or just for anybody that hasn't seen a leopard seal, it's that kind of thing there. Um, get my... so we get them from time to time in this area. We have them turn up. Often and they're they actually huge, from... aren't they, uh, Nathan? They're they're massive. Yeah, creatures. yeah, um, up to four hundred kilograms. Wow. So, yeah. And they're cool to see, you know. So I've, I think yeah. I've had interactions wise. I think I've had um, eight or nine uh, call outs to leopard seals, and and this is great about being a de- uh, about being a Department of Conservation volunteer. I get all yeah. the cool stuff that they call me on, you know. <laughs> it's I great. Thought, what happens then after that, Nate? Do you like when you get this information or data? Is there any oversight, or how do you go back and provide that information to the government, and then? Within the government, is there a scientific branch that actually takes that information from you? Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So for the various marine mammals, other than, say, common dolphins, for example, because we have a lot of common dolphins here. So we, I write a report. Um, there's a marine mammal sighting form, basically, on um, online. And so if it's orca or humpbacks or anything else, leopard seals, um then i'll basically write a report on it i'll take a lot of photos for identification purposes and um a lot of the photos i think are sent to to various researchers and um and then of course department of conservation have have images as well and i say department of conservation so doc for short um they use a lot of the photos for brochures the photos i take are used for brochures um online learning things like that and those photos are all free um, for them so that they're they can use them at their disposal but yeah. um yeah no it's good i mean there's there's been some leopard seals for example that have turned up and i'll look at the spots and i and i'll recognize them from where else they've been maybe in the country from various other photos wow so a lot of it is my own kind of sort of research um a lot of the time doc takes a take a hands-off kind of approach they let nature be nature which is which is actually good it's a good thing because we can sometimes get too involved and sometimes we need to just remember that as long as the wildlife is safe and in a safe area, then we need to sort of just actually back off a little bit and let, let nature be nature. So what is what, what would you say are the top three or the top five big challenges for marine life in your area specifically? Wow. 
Yeah, so we have a lot of boats, a lot of vessels, jet skis, things like that. And not just here, but but certainly in the North Island. We have a lot. The, the thing with Orca in particular when they come to this area is that there's one little entrance into our harbour. The entrance width-wise is about 500 metres, and it opens up to a very, very large harbour. The harbour itself is also very, very shallow. So if an orca comes in, and, w- and I'm talking, when I say shallow, I mean, you know you know how big an orca is, for example. Yeah. I'm talking one metre depth, a metre of depth in some parts of the harbour. So if an orca is in that part of the harbour, they can't go any deeper. So their fins sticking up, you know, yeah. you're going to spot it a mile off. And so what happens is they're easily, they're easily sighted by people on boats. So they get pretty pretty hammered uh, in the sense of um, being too close, um, blocking their um, their direction. Um, too many boats and um, you know, too many boats around them. We have a rule here that you can, and a lot of the public don't know it, but you know we have a rule that you can't have more than three boats within three hundred meters, and um, you can't get closer than fifty meters to uh, uh, any any orca or humpback whale or southern white whale. But a lot of people, you know, when it comes to orca, the rules just go out the window. Said, you know, a lot of people just, oh, I've got to get in there and I've got to get in there to get the shot. So, right. uh, the photo, I mean, I should. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> those days are gone down here, thankfully. So, that's probably the biggest issue is that they come into the harbor and when they do come in, you know, they've really, um, you know, a lot of boats in here, a lot of boats, a lot of jet skis. It's, it's a concern. Jet skis. God, there's, oh, yeah. Oh, jet skis. The speed. The speed. Yeah. And the thing with the orca as well is that if they do go down, orca and probably worldwide, but um, orca here in particular, they'll often separate into a few different groups. So you'll have a pod of about five to seven, generally speaking. And uh, they will, they'll break apart. So you might get two here and two here and two there. And what will happen is, I, like I always say, it's not the orca you see that's the concern, it's the orca you don't see. And mm. so boats will be racing all over the place and, um, you know, an orca can pop up right in front of them. And I've waved down so many boats. I've got this big orange kind of flag thing and I'm waving it frantically, slow down, slow down, slow down when I'm out there. Um, and I do take my boat now okay. because I can do that. You can't do that so well from a kayak. Kayak, yeah. Um, so, you know, and it, yeah, you slow people down and people have thanked me because they're like, geez, I didn't even see it, you know, with, with regards to the orca. I didn't even see it. You know, so it's like, oh god. You know, we we have one of the most run over run over population of orca in the world, and you see it on them. You know, they're all they're cut to bits. Um, dorsal fins have been sliced sliced open right down the middle. You know, cut right open. It's pretty bad. So, and considering that their dorsal fin is absolutely massive, like oh. like it, it it kind of doesn't make sense what's happening there because, like you said, it's only a couple of meters deep and. Like an orca clearly wouldn't be able to submerge themselves in that kind of level of water. Mm. So what are they doing? Are they people just purposely target? Are some people purposely targeting orca, or is it less aggressive than that? Yeah, no, they definitely wouldn't be. Um, they wouldn't be targeting them. It's just, um, and there are some areas in the harbour and certainly around uh, New Zealand where obviously they'll go down, especially if an orca. Um, and even dolphins, for that matter, especially if they're sleeping, you know, they yeah. sleep in various ways. And some will sleep at the surface and they'll just sit there. Um, and others will drop down for, a, you know, four or five minutes at a time and then come up, breathe a few times or blow a few times and then go back down. When they come up, bang, you know, mm. because there's, uh, the boat just doesn't see them. A lot of people, too, when orca are sleeping, for example, they look like a log. Yeah. So a vessel just thinks, oh, that's just a log in the distance. I'll just, I'll just miss it by about five meters, and then they realise when they're right on top of them that actually it's, it's actually an orca. So um, it seems to me yeah. that the government should go in there with some signage, or some like uh, send a, send a flyers to them. Like it seems to be a controlled <laughs> little space so that people would have to actually pass something, you know, in order to get in. Yeah, there. <clears throat> no, d- definitely, and. Um, and again, I guess that's where I step in with the yeah. education as much as I can, magazines, newspapers, things like that. 
Um, I think funding is a big part of it. If you go down to the boat ramps, uh, there's a lot of signage about fishing and what you can and can't do around, right. um, you know, re uh, rules about how much fish you can take and shellfish and all the rest of it. So it would be just another sign. Just what, and yeah. if you get too many signs, people just blow past yeah. them. Filter. Uh, yeah. Filter match, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but we are getting there. You know, someone actually said to me a while back, you know, actually, I think it was Doc. They said to me, you know, that I've made, I've made such a big difference to um, being aware of what we're supposed to do around wildlife. And that's, yeah. you know, kind of rewarding for me. Like, have I made a dent in it? You know, if I talk to 10 people, can I get two people that will, that will really listen to me? You know, and that's what it's about. Like, even if you're saving just one orca, like that's a massive <laughs> difference. That's, and that's it, mate. Yeah. That's it. You know, like if, I get, like of said, if I can get... Sorry, yeah, Major. If I can get people to slow down, if I can get people to to stop and think, oh, gee, that guy said, hey, if I, could, if I can get them to slow down, I'm, I'm winning. Yeah. Know, I'm winning. And that's, for me, that's what it's about. I mean, you know, we get close to these animals and stuff like that. And if people do get close, I mean, obviously they're breaking rules and regulations, but it's the speed that concerns me. You mm. know, that's, that's, that's the factor. And we don't have a lot. You know, New Zealand has... Um, in my opinion, we have probably less than 150 orca around the whole country. They're listed as nationally critical here. So we don't have a lot. Uh, but the North Island, for example, so you've pretty much got your North Island orca and you've got your South Island orca. So the North Island ones tend to go around the North Island um, mm -hmm. pretty much all the time. And then your South Island ones as well. So I haven't seen... I've I've seen hardly any South Island ones because they stay down there. So for for anyone that doesn't know the geographic kind of like layout of New Zealand, the North Island of New Zealand would be the most populated, dense area, urban area of um, New Zealand. Where the South Island is mostly uh, agriculture and sheep and and so on like that. So that's, correct. Yeah. So yep. that's, and that's... and the South Island is quite quite rugged. Mm. You know, it's a rugged country. Mm. Um, so, you know, the orca have a little bit more free reign down there. The people, the, the boats aren't on the water. They're not, they're not there as much. Whereas the North Island, it's just packed. Yeah. Packed. Um, so, you know, I'm seeing the same kind of four pods of orca around the North Island. Now, um, a lot of people think that we've got, you know, hundreds and hundreds of orca purely because we see them oh, relatively man. often. And it's because they come in so close. You know. what, what do they mainly feed on, um, Nathan? Is it mainly uh, ray? Yeah. 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 Yep. Mainly rays. Um, and do you um, see any of the kind of like spectacular shows where they launch them in the air of 40 meters in the air with some uh, no. rays? No, I'd love to. That'd be quite <laughs> a neat, um, as long as I got my camera ready. No, I do remember one time. So when the rays, um, or oh, sorry, when the orca come in, the rays obviously pick up on this and they go super shallow, super shallow. You know, they'll come in so shallow that their wingtips will be um, out, of, out the of the water. Yeah. yeah, so shallow. I do remember one time I was kayaking and there was an orca chasing a ray and the ray was scooting along the top of the water and wow. it actually threw itself it threw itself up onto the rocks to, to wow. basically survive. Yeah, so... Um, I never forget that. That was that was quite incredible. But we don't really have that sort of, you know, the smacking of things and things like mm. that. They um the rays are picked up off the bottom. They're generally turned upside down, uh, which puts the animal into a state of tonic immobility. Yeah. And um, and then they're fed on from there, and they're often the food is obviously you know shared amongst the pod. Um, but quite so incredible funny. to watch. In 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 South Africa. That's their, their strategy for um, starboard and port. That's their strategy That's right. for sharks is to put them into a, um, a catatonic paralysis by turning them upside down. Yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. And the orca will often come in. The orca will often come, if that's the ray, they'll come in upside down. And then wow. they'll, they'll pick the ray up by either the tail or the, or the wingtip. And then when they turn them over, of course, the orca is then the right way up. And the ray is then upside down, which is when that tonic mobility kicks in. So it's interesting how they come in um, with angles and things like that. Yeah. Clever. I mean, so clever. clever. Yeah. You know? 
Uh, um, that's amazing. Even be able to see that. And most of everyone on the group is going to be uh, shocked to know that I've never actually seen an orca in real life. <laughs> yeah, and and Nick, you know, I mean, I'm I'm very very fortunate, and I feel for people. You know, I mean, there's a lot of really amazing people on the page. Your page is fantastic, by the way, Nick. You've done an amazing job of bringing a bunch of people together. I mean, credit to you, bud. Really, really cool. And and the passion that I see with some of the people, um, it's amazing. And I need to remember that these are people that will possibly never see Orca in their lifetime, or certainly yeah. haven't seen them. And uh, you know, so I certainly don't take it for granted. You know, some some people like the options for a lot of people out there that maybe living inland or living in countries that don't have them very often. Like in Ireland, they do venture here in the north west coast of Ireland, but it's very seldom. You can't actually depend or or, or predict when they're going to arrive. Um, mm. And some people might be like that. So if their options are to go to um, horrible companies that put them in captivity or um, pay thousands and thousands to venture out into a place with the minute chance of actually spotting orca, you know, and mm. so mm. you're that's on your doorstep, you know. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, sorry, I just saw a um, we we have a quite a large pigeon in New Zealand. It's called the kiridu, and it's, the one's just flown into a tree, <laughs> not into the tree, onto the tree. Sorry. Um, no, you know, we're, we're very fortunate. And people come to me all the time or online and they'll say, oh, where do I go to see the orca? And I see it under some of the posts. Oh, where about are you exactly? And I think, you know, come to New Zealand for the beautiful country that it yes. is and, and orca will be a bonus because the chances mm. of you even seeing one are quite slim. Mm. You know, they are quite slim. So um, I've had many, many encounters, but this it's not a once a week thing. You Again, know. you don't want to be increasing the boats going out into the water, but a tourism industry. So, like, no, that's right. Yeah. I mean, um, the best way to see them is actually standing on shore, standing yeah. on the standing on the beach. Yeah. It's, it's, an, it's an amazing thing because you know you're actually on the beach and there's an orca literally about two meters from your feet. Wow! Like it's incredible, and they surf. Wow. They surf the waves here. The orca here like to surf the waves um which is amazing to see and it's it's incredible it's incredible it's amazing yeah so, we're very fortunate so what i'll go and ask you another question um what would be the most unusual event regardless of what marine life you you witnessed this with uh out on the ocean um in the in your area what would it be We had a southern right whale come in. Wow! Uh, um, into our harbour, a southern right whale, and um, like of all the things, I'm just trying to think, Nick. Of all the things I've done, so I, I, I would sometimes paddle out, you know, 12, 15 kilometres offshore, um, you know, around eight miles to get in amongst humpback whales. Um, but we actually had a southern right whale come into the harbour. The interesting thing with the what's important to know about all of this marine life is where they've been. You know, what have they been through? What, what are the, what was the population? And this is what I talk about when I do my, my talks. So there used to be about 70,000 Southern right whales um, in New Zealand, 70,000 around New Zealand. And they got hunted down to about a hundred. Wow. You know, they got, they got absolutely hammered. And that's how they got their name. They were the right whale to hunt, the Southern right whale. Uh, very easy to hunt. They would approach boats quite often. They were quite slow. And so they were, you know, very, very easy to hunt. And so they went from about 50 to 70,000 down to about 100. And um, a few of them basically hung out uh, and took refuge down in what's called the Auckland and Campbell Islands, which are further south of New Zealand. And by this stage, the whalers had pretty much given up because there was pretty much nothing left. And uh, these, this little wee tiny stronghold of southern right whales um, took refuge in these Auckland and Campbell Islands. And um, there, it's believed there was only 13 females left in that group. There were 13 females. From that, the numbers are starting to bounce back. Um, yeah. They're starting to bounce back. They actually, um, protection kicked in, I think I think it was 1935 for the Southern Right Whale here in New Zealand, but the Soviet Union at the time came down and hunted them again. So what numbers had bounced back got, got hammered again. So it dropped the numbers again. So where are... We're back on the up and up. So the reason I say this is because a southern white whale turned up into the um, to the harbour here, 
and it's a big thing you know mm. it's a big thing it's like well is, are they coming back you know mm. um do they feel safe? so i would what's that sorry to are they starting to feel safe again yeah yeah, yeah exactly um one of them wasn't wasn't reported off mainland new zealand for over 36 years you know that's how how decimated they were so one turned up here in the harbor and uh, i was in my kayak uh, the Department of Conservation was actually in their boat, and we came up with a plan to slow down any oncoming boat into the area to keep this thing safe. Mm. And because um, it was actually in one of the main channels where all the boats were coming back to the to the um, to the berth. Wow. So uh, yeah, so it was a juvenile southern right whale, still nine meters long. And um, yeah, we uh, we managed to keep this thing safe, and it was good, good story. So that was kind of remarkable, certainly in the sense of um something different you know and what we can do to save some of the stuff and, and making a, an impact so elena Walker, here. Okay, so, hey awesome i'm sure everyone in the group knows you already elena but yeah. elena is the resident expert and uh, she's got qualifications in marine biology and so on um she's currently residing in new york um in america and um she, great to have her <laughs> All right, well, let's kind of continue on and then I'll cultivate as we go because, you know, nine hours of hospital still, it's still on me. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. Hey, poor thing. <laughs> poor thing. Hey, so I like this... your background. Oh, yeah, my background's good. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's impressive. It is impressive. So, unfortunately, this thing, my parents got it for me when I was four from SeaWorld. Uh, you, know, you know, and this is the thing, you know, people didn't know really back then. <laughs> no, you know? didn't. people didn't know back then. Before so... Blackfish, everyone was in the dark, really. I know, yeah, but like, agreed. But look at this tapestry. This is a tapestry. So wow. I've had this tapestry for 30 years. That's cool. And nobody does a tapestry like that unless they love Orca. Mm -mm. Yeah, this was that's, on. That's right. This was on my bed when I was a child with my with my orca stuffies, and this has been on my wall in my bedroom as an adult since you know since I moved out of the house. It's gone everywhere with me. Wow, and, I love uh, it. Full of friends, and love it's that. a it's a Christian Reese Lason painting that was uh, converted to tapestry for SeaWorld in like 1992. Wow. Yeah. 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 Oh look, we've all we've all been there. I went to Hawaii when I was twenty twenty. I went to Hawaii, and I think the minute I got off the bus, I actually think I went to a Sea World kind of a place there, because we didn't know, you know, um, you know, to see wildlife, you know, for a lot of people, that's how you saw it. Yeah, you know, that's how that's how you saw it, or that's how you thought you saw it, uh, and then of course, you know, then you realise afterwards that oh, gee, these animals are actually you know, really quite social, uh, really yeah. quite intelligent. And actually, that's not where they belong at all. You know, we're not talking like a dog or a cat or something like that. Not that the dogs aren't um, intelligent, but, you know, these these are animals that belong um, um, belong where they, you know, where they where they come from. But even dogs and cats have more freedoms than Arca. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. Well, totally. it's interesting that you said that because we had H Hannah um, Stryger there a couple of weeks ago and what she said about um, captive orca is that they're not they're not a representation of orca. Great. No. They're I, I often no, say no. People, Yeah, correct. I often say to people that that those orca, um, sadly, are just not orca anymore. They're not, no. You know, they're not orca. They're anymore. so mentally abused. It's like if mm. you you see some humans coming out of um um solitary confinement and they're mm. just devastated they're broken people yeah. you know yeah. and, and yeah. toki they're she's 50 years in that now you know mm. so well um, she's what we would call institutionalized yeah. indefinitely mm. so mm. it's horrible. and that's where um, yeah. i think that's where we're quite lucky here in new zealand is that we um, we don't have that and We've got orca quite often quite close. I mean, we and you know, it's not just orca that we see. We see um, pseudo orca, false killer whales. Oh yeah, uh, from top. Wow. Yeah, yeah. They're now they're an impressive um, species. Mm. Man, I they move. They can be Boy, very they social as well. 
Oh, incredibly so. You know, they uh, they often um, are in tow with oceanic bottlenose dolphins. Um, so they have this kind of symbiotic relationship where they hang wow. out together. Yeah, um, incredible, incredible. Um, in fact, the researcher uh, for um, false killer whales in New Zealand is a guy by the name of Jochen, and he has a Facebook page called Far Out, Far Out Research, I believe. Certainly worth looking into. Uh, fantastic, really, really cool, but really cool species. I've seen them a few times. But um, we have those. We, on occasion, have bottlenose dolphins come through. Um, we have leatherback turtles come through I down here. Two meter, long, two meter long leatherback turtles. I love them. So, <laughs> yeah, I love they're them. They're amazing. <laughs> they would be up there with yeah. my favorite species. Oh, Every time incredible. I've ever been diving, they've, they've just found me and they're just so exquisite. They're beautiful and they're graceful. And I think that they're quite clever. Yeah. The yeah. turtles are amazing. Like we, um, the leatherbacks can regulate their body temperature to five degrees warmer than the surrounding water. So we get them as far mm. down here in, as New Zealand and we get them as high, they get them as high as Alaska. Um, so, yeah. yeah. They're, they're actually quite sensitive to heat. Um, if the environment where the eggs are laid is, um, again, somewhere in, between, in the region of 5% hotter or 10% hotter, they all turn into males. So what they're finding That's is... Right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah, which so, is concerning. It is with, concerning. Um, yeah. That's with the concerning. warming. Really <laughs> concerning. So all you're you... gonna be over, overrun. Wow. Yeah. I think um yeah, I think probably we would have to step in and and have yeah. temperature controlled um birth, you know, birth places of some sort. I'm not sure, but but yeah. luckily it's actually not too hard to do considering no. you know well, they the always go back is... to the same area. Yeah, and mm. the Galapagos has a very good interbreeding program there where they vary up everything and they have a lot of different generations of the tortoises on the Galapagos. And so mm. something, a similar operation would be easier to set up to maintain the gender mm. uh, the gender differences in the ocean so they're not all turning. But um, it's, it's, it's much easier to do those in captivity than it is anything yeah. dolphin up. I've yeah. got a question for you. Yeah. yeah, but now I have been looking for this for ages. This answer for this question. Um, oh my gosh! It yeah, is it, it is a <laughs> long time. This one. I was a young boy and I was watching this. There's an Irish uh, Irish channel called Tina G. It's a Gaelic. It's um our native language, um here in Ireland, uh dedicated to that. But what it was was they were down in New Zealand. And or there was this diver and he was diving with, I think it is a grouper, but uh, a grouper fish. Now, that's my memory, but of a very young age. And I know that there's the sunfish down there, which was present in your video. But this guy was massive. It, um, there was this diver down there and this at least three times or four times the size of a human, an adult, average size male. And it was massive and people go down there. Apparently, it's a very rare species of fish, but not uh, it's very slow and it doesn't it's not aggressive. And I think it's down the South Island um, on the southwest coast. Yeah, southwest coast of, the, of New Zealand. And if you have you ever heard of anything like that, a giant fish that people dive with? I haven't. When you said it, the first thing I thought was um, uh, some of the cod species that you get in Australia, and they are they are huge. But um, yeah, I haven't. Not to say they're not yeah. here. I'm going to look into that. It's going to be my homework. Like I say <laughs> to the school kids when I do my school talks, um, when the kid, when it's question time, if if I can't answer one of the questions, then that's their homework. Well, that's your homework. You can find that out. But um, we do have gropers here, and we have a fish called a harpooker. Uh, but um, I do remember seeing footage out of Australia of quite a massive, massive cod, and the thing was huge. And as you say, very slow moving. But um, I'll look into that. Now, this was definitely New Zealand, and I know oh, okay. it was real because there was a video. And the video, there was two divers down there, so I'll get perspective of the size of this thing. I know you can, wow. you can fool the camera, what you know, with you know. Yeah. Another example of that in New Zealand would have been larger rings with the hobbits, 
but like uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, but this guy was massive it was gigantic yes. fish and i've been looking for it and googling it ever since every, every so often i do it but there's still nothing i can't find anything about it. okay i'm gonna i'll find out i'll find out <laughs> It'll be yeah. my, i'll find out uh, we've got some cool <laughs> stuff down here. You know, 50% of all cetaceans around the world either live here or go past here. So we see quite a lot. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, we're cool. That's an excellent population. Cool. What's that, sorry? I said that's an excellent population. Brilliant, Nathan. Uh, we're back again. We had a short break there. In the next three years, Nathan, what, what, would you, what are the, the main thing that you really want to actually change? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nick, that's a good question. So, you know, a lot of this marine life is bouncing back. You know, we're seeing uh, we're seeing more numbers of southern right whales, humpback whales. Um, to give you an idea, really quickly, of humpback whales. So, the humpbacks obviously migrate from Antarctica and they go up, often past New Zealand. Some groups go to Australia. Some groups go to the islands. Now. 30 years ago, they did a count of um, humpback whales passing, uh, I think it was Sydney, and they counted them through the migratory route. And um, 30 years ago, they counted 300. And they did a count, I think, two years ago, and they estimate about 45,000. Wow. Going from that awesome. is going a magnificent that, jump in population. I that know is that really awesome. A it's, a, it's such a good story. And so you know, they're bouncing back. And what's happening is, of course, is in particular on the way back down from the islands in Australia, they tend to go past the eastern side of the North Island. When they go up, they often shoot straight up or they'll go past a part of New Zealand. But when they come back down, um, they come down the eastern side. So, you know, we are seeing more, more wildlife. In certain species, we're seeing more of them. In two to three years, what would I like to see? I'd like to see a lot more people knowing this information from your direct input you know, from your direct activity what would you like to see changed i'd like to see people just really you know keeping that distance and keeping the speed down that's what that's what i'm all about enjoying enjoying the wildlife but let's do it um you know respectfully yeah yeah they get, you know, these wild, they get a hard time. You know, you've got um, nets that they get caught up in. There's a whole heap of things. There's pollution. You know, we don't need to add to any issues for them through um, trying to get too close for that Instagram selfie. And, and look, I, I know better than anyone. I was the one that was that was breaking all these rules. So, you know, I, I know how it works, you know. Um, but then there's nothing like being given a permit to actually make you stop and think, oh, as you said earlier, Nick, you know, gee, I've got some responsibility now. And um, so I don't really tend to put up too much anymore on from the old kayak. I'd rather take my boat out, which I'm not permitted for, because I'm I'm permitted for for two kayaks, um, a single and a double. Um, and but I take my boat because you know it's easier. I'm happy to keep distance because I have big lenses now. I don't need to get close. So that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see a lot more um, uh, people being respectful around the wildlife. And we get in there, you know, we get in there for the most part. Oh, well, thanks to Can you. you tell since, me, uh, I do have a good question about that. Can you tell me a little bit about your process, about how you discovered what was better for the animals as you went on? Because like you said, like things have changed a lot. So when you first started doing this, like what were your habits like and what have they changed to now? Um, and what would you like regulations to be knowing what you do now about these populations of cetaceans? I mean, the regulations here are the regulations here are perfect. They're good regulations. It's just that not many people know about them. Hmm. You know, that's the thing. I mean, um, and this is what I've always said is that you know we've got these rules and regulations that nobody knows about. Uh, they're on the Department of Conservation website and things like that, but there was really no one actively going out there and and talking about them. And so, you know, through that and through the newspaper articles that I said, as I mentioned earlier, that I've done and the radio interviews and. Um, you know, we're starting to slowly, you know, see more progress in that area. But, you know, the thing is with orca is that when orca turn up, you know, all the rules go out the window. People just want to get on. They just want to get in there. 
Mm. And certainly with, um, you know, when I do my talks, you know, the effects, the negative and positive effects of social media. Um, if ever I come across Orca, I will never post at the time that I'm with them. You know, you get these live videos and um, I never do that. I always wait. If, I, if I'm going to post at all, I'll always wait until, you know, a day or two later when I know they've moved on. Um, because, you know, in 10 people, you're going to get one person that's going to, that's going to try it on. That's going to, you know, go out. And, um, that's and so true. It's like that, that there's always that tipping point in, in terms of statistics. And it's the main reason mm. I won't mention any brand names of Orca Marine Parks, because there will be at least one person who sees that and goes, oh, you know what? You know? Yeah. So I think, I think the other thing, too, with what I'm doing, guys, is that is that anybody can do it. You know, you don't have to change the world to to make a difference um, in marine conservation. I'm simply just going to the schools. Anybody can do it. I'm just going to the schools and talking about wildlife and I'm doing it in a nice, respectful way for the kids or for adults, whoever I'm talking to. It's it's basically it's baby steps and it's and it's it's grassroots kind of um, input to the community. Anybody can do it. It doesn't have to be a big, a big thing. Um Anybody can make a small difference. You were mentioned about the, the policies that were introduced from the government, but who's um, policing those? Are is it the, the is it the um, the water police? Or I know that it's the water police in Australia. But what would it be there? Would it be a different branch, or is it the? Yeah, good question. No, so it is actually policed by the Department of Conservation, and when we say policed, they're not on the water here. Uh, all the time um, so what I've done is I through I guess building rapport I have um, got alongside our local um, harbour master who was like <laughs> a you know he's the, he's the guy that or they're the people that go and check people's life jackets and make sure you got life jackets and you're not speeding and things like that so I've gotten alongside with them. And so if the orca come in, I will let them know. And then they will just have some sort of presence around the orca if they've got time to be able to do that, which they generally do. They've been fantastic. They can't um, police people, police it or find people or anything like that, but they have some presence, uh, which is which is nice. Yeah, we don't have on-water police here um, like they do in other places. So What's they are my help. Nathan? What's it? Sorry, it, that's it's you then. You're the, you're the police essentially, pretty yeah. much, without being the police. If you know yeah. what I mean, it's me going. <laughs> I guess I would call it an on water education education person kind of thing. You know, on water <laughs> educate educator. So when I'm out there, I'll I'll sort of say to people, "Hey guys, you might just want to back off a little bit. You know, those orca are actually sleeping at the moment." And um, you, is there is there um. Is there, uh, I know that there is in Ireland, uh, for example, there's these uh, clubs or yacht clubs and uh, kind of like places where people who have boats to go to and there's a central location and you have to join this thing and all that, this other monarchy. Um, is there anything like that in New Zealand? And if so, would it be possible for, or have you approached them to do talks for them uh, to get that kind of message out to a broader you know, yep. audience? Yeah, no, good question. So um, the answer is yes. So we've got yachting clubs, there's fishing clubs. Um, still trying to get my foot in the door, certainly with the fishing clubs. The um, A lot of fishermen a lot of fishermen are respectful, but there's a lot that I need to, you know, get in front of. And um, it's, yeah, yeah. I need to. I need to do that. About, the, um, what about like local aquariums and things? Not like marine parks, but local aquariums. Have you tried partnering with aquariums to talk about conservation? Because you are waterlocked. Mm, we so don't have aquariums. You don't. Not not here. There's there's one in Auckland. There's a <laughs> few. There's a few around, but for the most part, we don't we don't have aquariums. We've got one, as I say, in Auckland, which has got some sharks and things like that. Um, but there's nothing here. There's nothing here. Well, that's so it's different. all done, like I say, it's all done by magazine, uh, radio interviews, and newspaper for me. I actually like that. <laughs> I don't know. I like yeah. that. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. I know that I, um, some some um, aquariums have, like the ones that I know of, um, they mainly focus around education. 
and yeah. and what kind of species live in the mar local marine um yeah, habitats um i know that but it's still i don't like anything in captivity so i'm kind of happy that mm. it doesn't exist there yeah i mean there are obviously there are some places or in some situations where they do have certainly some some pluses um you know in the sense of education they can be good and new zealand's very very good i mean we certainly don't well i feel like we don't do it um purely for profit there's definitely education and conservation in in a lot of it uh if if say one of our turtles for example swallows a fish hook or something like that they then go to the zoo for any surgery that may be required and then from there they are taken to that aquarium in auckland for um, rehabilitation and then from there they are then released back into the wild yeah that's cool so yeah they they have some um some good points and we don't really tend to have anything other than other than sharks and rays um you know there's no marine mammals or anything like that which is good i think that is very good um the states does not have good regulations for these things and they're widespread and there's a lot of them in every state there's quite a few in pretty much every state you can go to zoos and aquariums and in major states we do have marine parks here which is something that you know obviously not something we want but um but no if it's not prevalent it's not really an option for advertising for safety for mm. the animals i just mm. don't see the practicality of uh aquariums since you have these amazing lcd screens um and you have these yep. amazing underwater photographers and and you could take you know any number of different footage and have it in on in a kind of a display and have people going through it just like you do um mm. in an aquarium and hey mm. this is on your doorstep get out off your butts and uh, maybe have a look That's at yourself right. you know yeah and we do have, you know, we have tourist dolphin boats around, obviously around the country. Um, I I actually help out on one from time to time. I do all the I do all the commentary uh, right. and all the spotting. Uh, the one that I'm on, um, we are very very strict on um, regulations, and and it's great because it gives me a chance to get on the microphone and basically mention all of what I've talked to you guys about, but to the people on board. And it's it's a yeah. fantastic platform. And you definitely have that gift of the gab there, Nathan. So you do. So <laughs> you do. You're so charismatic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. good. It's um. I'm very I'm very fortunate. I'm very fortunate. But you know that dolphin boat. I work for a, it's a company called um, Dolphin Safaris here in in Tauranga, and it gives me a platform. And I don't work there for. I don't need help out every now and then. But it gives me a platform, as I say, to um, reach more people. Know, to, inform people yeah and when i rattle off some of the of the uh, statistics you know you see people shaking their heads about what some of these animals went through i see it when i'm on the mic and i'm thinking yes i'm getting through that's mm. what i want i want them to, to nod their heads like oh my god what have we done and then i'll pick them back up again with how well the numbers some of the numbers are doing and it's rewarding you know it's um we get in there in some areas we get in there so it's amazing it's great well, but we're seeing more manta rays we're seeing more manta rays down here because of course you know, well, I assume it's through the warming of the water or whether it's citizen science, people are seeing more because they're looking for them, but we are, we do appear to be having more manta rays. We get, um, we have hammerheads here in the summertime, so I get really excited. Sometimes I'll go out and I'll see five or six hammerheads. Uh, we have the second largest in, in the world. We've got the smooth hammerhead. They grow to about four meters long oh, and beautiful to watch, beautiful to watch. We're lucky down here. Anybody that's listening, you know, Definitely come to New Zealand, and if you come to my part of the world, then certainly give me a shout. And we'll catch up for coffee. But we're very, very fortunate. Just You're welcome. Throw me your, throw me your air code there. You know your your postal code, and I, 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 I right over Nathan. <laughs> yeah, do it. Come, come down. You and you know, if not for the wildlife, the country itself is beautiful. You know, it's a, we're very fortunate. My great uncle uh, emigrated from Ireland over to New Zealand, and he was a he was a, a sheep farmer. He owned a, a plane, and you know normal story over in south uh the south island and he came over and he was just i hate to say this stereotypical irish he came back with his money and he bought a pub <laughs> yeah <laughs> and um yeah that was his story and how my i'm connected in a little tiny bit to uh 
New Zealand. That's cool. Yeah. That's cool. But uh, New oh, Zealand is always it's a fascinating place. Yeah. They, At some uh, stage, I'll... Uh, sorry, Nick, you go. They are one of the first countries in the world to um, outlaw uh, cats, domestic cats, and uh, from going into the local environments. Um, in Australia, they have a big problem with cats because they eat, they mm. eat one billion birds a day. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. They yeah. Are we have been the they issue, yeah. bird populations, and they do in the states too. And so there's some there's some organizations that are pressing towards not letting cats outside because they will decimate bird populations. Mm. Yeah. But yeah. Cat same lovers, they hate that. And you know, I I yeah. like cats. I really do. I like cats. I like but cats. Gosh, they they are such murderous little love. Oh, they are not, it's not good. Yeah. <laughs> but um Elaine, have you seen Orca in the Wild? I I have. I saw Orcas in the Wild when I was nine years old. I went out on a Seattle cruise line and saw oh, them yes. about five hundred uh five hundred meters north um in the San Juan Islands. Got about as close to zoom in on a camera to see their dorsal fins. And um best moment of my life, not gonna lie. Best moment yep. of my life. That's cool. <laughs> Um, oh, that's but cool. I haven't seen them up close um, in the wild yet. Yeah. Um, I've never worked in the field. Mm. So first of all, yeah. personal qualifications, I'm a marine biologist, but I lived mm. in Arizona my whole life. And then I moved wow. to a few months ago. So. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's never so too late, Elena. Never too late. It's never too late. I know That's it's never right. too late, but I've got a plan. I've got a plan. So I moved to central New York and we're getting closer to being able to move out of the country, out of the U.S. to start working uh, with marine biology out of the country. But in order to do that, cytology doesn't usually pay the bills. So I am a diet nurse at a hospital <laughs> to pay the bills and to save up yep. so I can get to a place where I can do, where I can really practice science in the wild and participate yeah. in conservation. But activism and information is a real passion and which is why we were so excited to talk to you because you have that reach and you have that charisma and you have the photography and the permit. And it's just beautiful to see someone who respectfully uses, you know, that, that much advantage. Um, mm. And mm. there's no one like you in the States, that's for sure. Um, mm. no Guys, one we you. have been going on for an hour and a half. I didn't realize I was just having too much Whoa. fun. Wow, <laughs> look at us. <laughs> an hour and a half. Yeah. So oh, it, we can so continue if we, we so want to. to, talk to you guys. We can continue if you want to. That's entirely up to you. I put it as a vote. Um, it's 10.30 p.m. here in Ireland. Um, oh I know gosh. it's 11 hours going backwards for you or four. Have we covered enough? Have we covered enough orca for the group? Is there anything else we haven't touched on? But this um, story, this this video is about you, Nathan, because okay. you're 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 quite unique. You're okay. in the orca world sphere. Um, mm. you've discussed what your conservation efforts for orca is. Um, I I you know. If you have any more information, I think everyone's going to be listening. Um, Everybody's yeah. listening for ways to get in, uh, to get into the movement and to to continue to be passionate while they're here and be able to keep them here. Mm. So, I mean, I think everyone's going to hold on to words. Yeah. Oh, look, it's such a it's such a cool group. I mean, you know, I've looked at Orca Facebook Orca pages, you know, for quite some time, and I found your group and. Um, you know, I love it. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I can, I can be, I can actually kind of be a bit freer. And Nick, we've talked about this before, uh, where I can be a bit freer on this page. And mate, you've done such a, you guys have done such a fantastic job. You know, you really have. It's all, it's all Nick and Jennifer. I'm like, I just post educational content when I have time. It's hey, should we talk Jen about the orca like... that are attacking the boats? <laughs> <laughs> Jen, oh, here's my take. I'm gonna I'm gonna touch on this. I'll touch on this. One thing about okay. one thing about me is that I sit very very neutral. It's very easy, certainly in the world of well any wildlife really. It's very easy to cast opinions and cast what we you know 
you know, just cast, well, opinions, really, without um, science and research doing its thing. But, um, you know, the word attack gets thrown around quite a bit with some of these articles, you know, it attacked the boat oh. and attacked the boat. And I'm going to throw it out there. I'm going to break my rule of not, of not giving opinions. And I'm actually going to give an opinion. And I actually think they're just messing with us. I think they're so intelligent that they think, oh, man, that's a bit of fun doing that. I did that to that last object that was moving through the water. If I take that little wee swivel thing off, then this whole big vessel thing stops in the water dead. <laughs> it's so, so funny that you said that, actually. Uh, Nathan, I think uh, it's funny that you said that. I have a personal opinion formed about, or at least a hypothesis formed about it, but I missed the the Spain interview. Um and I'm I can't wait to watch the Spain interview because that's gonna be a hoot. And then Hannah, um, the video wouldn't load for Hannah's thing um on my phone. So I have to go back and try and reload that because she weighed in on it as well. But my personal opinion kind of aligns with aligns with Nathan is that they're just so intelligent and they do catch behaviors and they will show each other how to do things if they're bored or if it amuses them. And that's not um that's not an um a behavior that's limited to orcas that are in captivity that curiosity mm. does kind of get it goes a little bit yeah, which is not. why we see which is why we see such behaviors repetitive behaviors of orcas going back to do more and be more included in interesting mm. activities so yeah it, it, it's yeah, funny I, because I, I i i was doing this interview yesterday actually um or is it today no yesterday no it was yesterday <laughs> it, was, it yesterday. was yesterday yeah <laughs> um about two main scientists are covering that actually part of the world and they're the actual people uh covering this phenomena and the funny thing is is that they're not getting any coverage um and people asking them about what's going on so sensationalists um yes uh sensationalist yeah. publications have taken the biggest example of Chinese whispers and they said that yep. these boats are ta are attacked whereas the, the Spanish scientist I was talking to yesterday Monica and um uh God um I can't remember the gentleman's name but uh, this is coming this one this video is going to be published after the Spanish one so um <laughs> none of this should be spoiler to people but they what they said was um there's there's three two hypotheses that one it could have been gladys uh what they were talking about gladys gladys got hit um by a, a leisure vehicle fishing illegally fishing um using big hooks and it got caught and then she retaliated and hit the boat but what happens in in orca society is that she is a matriarch and all the juveniles were looking at her kind of taking um, revenge out on this boat. Um, and they said, well, I need to do that too, because this is a part of our culture mm. to follow the matriarch. Mm. So now that the juveniles have just taken away with, with that and, mm. and are disabling the rudders on the back of these boats, it has nothing to do with fishing, um, overfishing. That's another big um, insight too, mm. because the red... Yeah. No. The red, oh, um, really this. the red tuna is actually has larger numbers this year, population mm. numbers than it has been in the past. Mm. So there's mm. no shortage of fish. Um, mm. So it is looking like it's either what you said right there, um, that this is just some juvenile delinquency <laughs> or <laughs> yeah. um, it is uh a taught pattern from a matriarch called gladys mm. yeah mm. i um yeah i mean look I've, I've heard i was talking to a guy oh last year and i remember him saying that an orca came along and picked up his anchor rope he was anchored while he was fishing and the orca picked up his anchor rope and swam towed the boat um from one part of the bay to Gosh. the other now that's not the orca attacking the boat that's just no. the orca just having a bit of fun you know, and, um, you know, bearing in mind that New Zealand orca are pretty well run over quite a bit. And yeah. I know they're all unique and they all have different thought processes. They're exactly like us. I always say they're the underwater equivalent of you and I. Um, but, you know, we've never had anything like that. Any revengeful thing happen with with the uh, the orca down here. Um, 
so that's not to say that that's not happened up there, but I actually think that the Orca have just found a new fun thing to do. That's what I, I think a lot of it's been blown out. And I think if hypothetically somebody ended up in the water with these particular Orca and, you know, my belief is that they wouldn't do anything to the people. Um, it's not a malicious thing. I, I and the, yeah. it, there's nothing scientific about what I'm saying. It's just an opinion. But I think I don't actually think it's anything more than they're just having a bit of fun. They're quite intelligent. So I guess it's as different as the orca around the world that feed on different different prey. You know, know, they all have these. They all have a different food source. They all have different ways of doing things. Different hunting techniques. Different ways of having fun. Um, so yeah. I think my my personal thing is, you know, we'll we'll wait and see what it all comes out. But you know, we can't, we can't speculate, I guess, too much until that happens. I but, just yeah, hope that like these fear mongering articles stop and stop saying the words attack because like I agree. what what the scientists over there are saying that these are interactions, like it's interaction mm-hmm. with a boat, and that's what's happening. Yeah. It's not attacks. Yeah. And well, they, I think the distinction is important to put out there because sensationalists will say whatever they want to get an article viewed. You know, that's how a lot of that's how a lot of these particular journalists will get paid. And so there's incentive to make it a clickbaity article or to make people want to subscribe and read those things. Um, and of course, there's been a lot of heat on Orcas and Stilicum. And uh, people are interested in whether or not they're dangerous in the wild. And it's a very common question that we have in our orca group is, are they dangerous? Can I be in the water with them? And I never, ever tell anyone that they're exactly safe, you know, but they probably Great. won't, you know. Yeah. Well, it's impossible. And again, you, you know, you've seen the um, the videos from down here in New Zealand. There's people swimming with them, you know, quite often. They just... You know, with the with the food source being in such shallow water, they'll often come across people swimming, and half of it's not even documented or videoed. So, well, um, Nathan, do you know that lady that's in that video? No, happen- no, but she that is in a place that I go where she was swimming. Yeah, yeah, no, that's in a place that I go um, camping though. I go camping there all the time. If you ever um, and come it's across not- her in your travels, if you ever get to talk to that person in that video, I'd like to actually have a quick chat with them. Yeah, okay. No, we'll do. New Zealand's a small place, so... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, these these yeah, those sort of interactions cool. happen quite a bit, you know. And it's it's not the adults. It's not the adults you you sort of... The adults, you know, they don't, they don't care. Yeah. They don't really care. It's the calves, you know, the juveniles that are curious, you know. And it's the same as when I'm in my kayak. It's the juveniles that will want to know what you are and what's that object and what's this and that. The adults will stick around, obviously, probably for protection of that calf. But for the most part, yeah, it's the it's the young ones. So, um, and for you know, like I say, to, to to finish up on, I guess, if if an orca um, approaches anybody, then just remain calm. You know, don't you don't you don't need to yell and scream. And I've seen people bang boats because they think that the animals like the sound. They don't like the sound. There's enough noise pollution as it is. You know, just stay calm. You know, enjoy the moment. It's what I call the magic moment. Enjoy it. You know, it's a be- it's a beautiful thing. And then when the animals move on, let them move on. That's that's nearly identical to what the, the Spanish scientist said. He said, "Turn off your boat engines. Don't make noise. Don't scream and make noises and so on, because that mm. actually makes them more curious to come up and investigate. Um, mm. When nothing happens, they just move on. Yeah. Yeah. yeah realistically, we want them to be disinterested. Yeah. Yeah. And you want it to be, I mean, we'll never break down. You never say to people, oh, you can't spend time with Orca. That would never happen. But what we can do is we can say, hey, just, you know, be respectful. Don't make noises. <laughs> you know, just enjoy enjoy the moment. Enjoy and the slow moment. down. And slow down. Please, people, slow down. Oh, <laughs> oh thank you. For I would saying. love please. to see a drastic reduction in strikes and injuries in, in wild animals not just the orcas but in general mm. yeah because i mean like yeah. they're not the only ones that do get boat strikes larger whales will also will also retain yeah. injuries from that yeah exactly it just um, opens them up to so many other things infections and disease and mm. not healing mm. well and it's not great mm. So what we'll do now is actually we'll stop it here. We're coming up to two, nearly two hours. Um, wow. 
<laughs> yeah um it was great to having a chat with Janet. uh we should do this another time if you if you come yeah. across anything new yeah. or like that um, well next time i'll go for a walk somewhere and i'll take my camera with me oh and God. i'll video what i see you know okay. that'd be that'd be a pleasure that'd be that'd be cool. lovely i'm sorry no, thank you for, every- for the beginning of the interview but this has been fantastic well you get to see thank it anyway you. elena but um yeah <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. Honestly, I'm I'm grateful for what you guys are doing, and I'm grateful to be um, here talking to you as well. So, we're, well, we're delighted yeah. to have you for as a member of the group. Um, some amazing shots and videos coming from Nathan Pettigrew, and uh, he's an impactful uh, journey through his own area in New Zealand. He's important discussions through kids, the next generation of New Zealanders that will have the biggest impact on these animals. Um, thank you very much for all you do, uh, Nathan, um, for this interview and being a member of the group. And thank you very much, Elena. You have been an uh, absolute star. And I know that you've had thank a you. massive long day in work and you came in to just say hello to us at the end there. Um, it thanks, was the only thing I was excited about today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a darling. Thank you so much. So thanks very much, everybody. And Thank you. See you later. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye, Bye guys. <laughs>